Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to uh, uh, today's edition of the BioXL webinar series. Uh, today, we're going to hear about uh, furthering our understanding of antibody structure space, um, and this comes from the Pistoria Alliance Advance project. And um, we have a couple of presenters for you today: uh, Sebastian Kelm from UCB and Richard Norman from uh, Pistoria Alliance. And I am your host, Ian Harrow. So, moving along, hopefully. Uh, this is to remind you that this webinar is being recorded. First, I'll start with a, a short overview of BioXL. Um, BioXL um, has, um, is a uh, center of excellence for computational biomolecular research funded by Horizon 2020. Uh, we have uh, three pillars of excellence, uh, excellence in uh, biomolecular software, uh, which focuses on our three main codes for, um, for Gromax, uh, Haddock, and CPMD. Our second pillar is excellence in usability, where um, we devise efficient workflow environments with associated data integration. And on this slide are some of the workflow platforms uh, that we support. And then finally, um, excellence in consultancy and training, where we promote best practices and train end users. So just um, to point out, we have a number of interest groups as part of BioXL, uh, covering a number of uh, uh, relevant uh, aspects of computational biomolecular research. And these are listed on this slide. And we also uh, host a number of support platforms, which are also on this slide. So for this webinar today, uh, we will have a, an audience Q&A session uh, at the end of this webinar. Um, so for this, uh, you should make use of the, um, the questions panel uh, that you will find. Um, so please um, enter your questions as we go along during the uh, webinar that you may have and uh, we will um, uh, the presenters will uh, try to answer your questions uh, during the Q&A session at the end so let's just turn to our today's presenters um, so I've mentioned uh, we have Dr Sebastian Kelm of UCB uh, Sebastian's been working at UCB uh, since 2013 he holds a position as principal scientist in the computer-aided drug design group, uh, where he supports the development of new medicines. Um, and his specialty is in creation and application of software to model 3D structures and interactions of proteins, with particular interest in antibodies, which we're going to hear about today, and membrane proteins. Uh, our, our second presenter is uh, Richard Norman of the Pistoria Alliance. Uh, Richard uh, manages the Pistoria Alliance Advanced Project, which you're going to hear about. Uh, Richard manages um, his um, consulting business, um, and he's been um, providing services to the pharmaceutical, biotechnology, and related life science industry. Um, and he's had over 15 years of experience working in the biotech and pharmaceutical industries, supporting discovery and development of uh, new drugs, diagnostics, and nutraceuticals. So, uh, without further ado, let's um, uh, turn to the presentation and our first presenter. Over to you, Sebastian. Thanks, Ian. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sebastian. Um, I will be presenting the first part of the talk. Um, and uh, before I move on, I would like to stress that actually a lot of the work I will be showing uh, was done by Dr. Konrad Kravchik, who is a uh, postdoc at uh, Professor Charlatine's group in uh, Oxford, uh, the Oxford Protein Informatics Group. Um, and towards the end, I will hand over to Richard. Um, okay, go ahead, next slide. Uh, so here's the overview um, of my, well, actually of the whole talk. So uh, first I will give a very brief introduction to antibody structural biology. Um, I should say I'm not uh, an antibody biologist, I'm a computational person, but uh, I will uh, aim to uh, 
a very brief introduction for those of us who aren't uh, working in the antibody field. Um, I will then talk about the impact of uh, 3D structural information on uh, therapeutic antibody projects, uh, specifically with three examples uh, uh, at UCB, uh, the company I'm working for. Um, and then I will give a comment of uh, the application of 3D modeling, uh, and especially with a view towards large-scale applications to uh, uh, next generation sequencing data sets, which can have millions of sequences. Um, and then move on to uh, the problem of being able to model all of those millions of sequences um, and uh, essentially figuring out where the gaps in our knowledge are in terms of our ability to model. Um, and then I will hand over to Richard who will uh, present the Pistoia Alliance Advance Project, uh, which aims to address some of the gaps in our knowledge in this field. Okay, next slide. Ian, can you? Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, so uh, introduction to antibodies. Um, we have, uh, or I will mention uh, two types of antibodies in this talk, so I'm concentrating on these. Uh, IgGs are your very typical antibodies that we usually talk about and look at when we look at antibody structure. Um, you can see the, the rough domain makeup here on the left with uh, three constant domains on, in the heavy chain uh, with a, a variable domain at the top and uh, a light chain with the constant domain and the variable domain. Two copies of each of these uh, make up the antibody. Um, the IgGs are essentially the largest part of your adaptive immune response um, and are secreted in the blood as a response to, to invasion by pathogens. The IgMs uh, are a different version, essentially a different isotype of antibodies, which uh, when in the blood appear as this type of pentamer you can see there, um, otherwise quite similar in shape. Um, to the IgGs uh, and um, they are essentially an earlier version of antibodies which is prevalent mainly immediately after invasion by pathogens. Um, and in the blood they are uh, present as this, these pentamers but they're also present as uh, a B cell uh, surface receptor. So as a single copy of uh, an antibody on the B cell surface. Um, next slide. Uh, if we look at these antibody structures uh, as a just slightly more realistic uh, version, this is still a cartoon representation of course, um, then here on the left you have an IgG molecule with a heavy chain, uh, two copies of the heavy chain in bluish colors and uh, light chains in greenish colors. In the middle you have the uh, variable region uh, zoomed in, which has six uh, loop structures here uh, highlighted, uh, which form the complementarity determining region loops, uh, which, as the name suggests, um, determine uh, the complementarity with the antigen. So uh, they determine what, uh, what protein an antibody binds to. Um, and that's where most of the sequence variability is as well in these antibodies. On the right side, you have such a V region of an antibody bound to an antigen um, with uh, on the left side in red highlighted the paratope, which is essentially the union of all of these complementarity determining regions. Um, and it is essentially those parts of those CDR loops that interact with the antigen. Uh, and on the antigen side, you have the epitope, which is the residues on the antigen that interact with the antibody. Um, next slide. Uh, now we have uh, a huge number of potential antibodies in our, uh, in our body. Our body can make a, a huge variety of antibody sequences um, that are potentially complementary to a huge variety of antigens. 
Um, now, part of this diversity comes from the way these antibody sequences are created once, uh, when, when the B cell matures. Uh, the genome of a B cell contains many copies of different segments of genes here, V, v gene segments, D gene segments, J gene segments, um, which are somewhat redundant and uh, essentially to create a single B cell genome, uh, the cell picks and chooses from uh, these segments to form uh, a close to unique uh, final sequence uh, of a, an antibody essentially. Um, which is then transcribed and translated into protein um, and ends up as a B cell surface receptor uh, IgM antibody on the on the B cell surface. Um, when the uh, B cell then class switches to produce IgGs later on, um, it will further change the sequence via hypermutation of the variable region. Um, which is focused on the CDR loops and create even more different potential sequences and therefore uh, potentially closer binding to the antigen of interest that's invading the body um, and much more specific binding as well. Um, next slide, please. So uh, moving on to the importance of 3D structure. Um, so here's a first example of a drug discovery project from the past, which uh, is kind of a classical way of doing things. Uh, initially, there was no involvement of three-dimensional structure in the creation of this antibody. Uh, instead, animals were immunized uh, with an antigen and uh, then B cells were isolated from the animals and they were screened for uh, antibodies that bound to the antigen of interest and through a large screening uh, campaign uh, an antibody was identified that had desirable properties bound to the antigen um, strongly enough and then uh, it was a crystal structure was obtained of this antibody bound to the antigen, which you can see on the right here, it's been published. The antibody is called olocuzumab, um, binds to uh, IL-6. Uh, and as the crystal structure showed, uh, it actually binds uh, roughly in the same place where IL-6 interacts with its uh, co-receptor GP-130, and therefore binding of the antibody displaces this receptor and that's how the antibody works. Um, so the, the, the crystal structure here wasn't used to create the antibody, but it was used to rationalize uh, how it worked, how it performed its function. And this uh, was vital to uh, obtain a patent and uh, essentially uh, apply for approval of the antibody um, and move it towards uh, the clinic. Next slide, please. Uh, a different approach here, which is also becoming fairly common now, is uh, to, to start from an existing antibody, um, which may have been identified using the screening approach I just talked about, or phage display, or something else, and then uh, trying to engineer it uh, in silico, so on the computer, to uh, improve its uh, binding affinity to an antigen. Um, at UCB, we have a tool which uh, produces pictures such as the one on the right, where given a crystal structure of the antibody bound to the antigen, uh, we can essentially scan the surface of the antigen and um, generate these contact preference clouds, which tell you um, which kinds of atoms uh, should be in the vicinity of each atom on the antigen surface in order to essentially satisfy that anti antigen surface. Um, so we can then look at the uh, overlap between the antibody sidechain structures and these contact preference clouds and see where we can improve this overlap 
um, essentially, for example, here at the bottom, uh, mutating this threonine to uh, a glutamate would uh, move the side chain into this contact preference cloud, um, where in this case uh, it would satisfy this and uh, essentially generate a, a favorable score. And of course, once you've created a design in silico, you then need to go to the lab and test uh, usually not just one, but a series of designs um, and uh, hopefully get some that uh, improve affinity. Uh, in this case, uh, we had an antibody uh, which bound to one particular isotype of a protein and we wanted to make it bind uh, to a second isotype of the same protein. And through engineering in this fashion, we've um, we improved the affinity to that second isotype by 200 fold and ended up with a bispecific antibody, which using the same uh, the same uh, paratope, so the same anti uh, antibody CDR loops bound to two different versions of the same protein. Um, next slide, please. Uh, hold on, one back. There we go, the Novo design. Um, so the third example is uh, the Novo design. So here we start from nothing essentially. We do not start from an antibody. We have only the antigen of interest and we uh, look for natural binding partners of this antigen um, that we have the structure of. So here we, we had a structure of uh, the protein called KEEP1 uh, binding to uh, a peptide fragment of another protein called NRF2 and um, by taking uh, a few key hotspot residues on the surface uh, of NRF2 that interacted with KEEP1, um, we then transplanted these residues onto an antibody framework uh, and further uh, affinity matured the antibody sequence to further uh, create uh, further complementarity between the antibody and the, the antigen here. Um, and ended up with an antibody that bound at nanomolar affinities to keep one. Um, this also has been published, uh, as you can see at the bottom here. Um, of course, uh, again, usually it's not a, a one-shot success. You have to uh, test various designs, uh, and you might even do uh, things like phage display uh, to uh, further explore various options and variations of your designs in order to finally uh, identify your your uh, your final binder um, okay next slide so i've talked about use of structures and now i'm going to talk about modeling so uh, of course if you can obtain a crystal structure of your antibody, that's great. That is uh, probably what you want if you can get it uh, within the time frame that you need it at. However, it's not always possible to do this uh, quickly and it's not always possible to do this on a large scale, um, which is when you need to do modeling. Um, so our collaborators uh, in Professor Charles Dean's group uh, have made a tool called a body builder which uh, Richard will mention again later on. Um, and the great advantage of that tool is that it's, well, at least as accurate as, as everything else, but also it is extremely fast. You can make a model in 30 seconds and it is uh, it will tell you when the model is likely to be reliable and when parts of the model are not so reliable. And that is essential because uh, if we're uh, relying on these models, then uh, you know, if, we, if essentially if we're uh, having to uh, do a lot of wet lab work to test uh, the uh, assumptions based on this model, then um, that's a, a big investment. And if we already know the model isn't reliable, then we, we can just skip that part and, and uh, not bother with that model. Um, now we're, more and more moving towards large-scale approaches where alongside, for example, an antibody immunization campaign, um, 
we create these large sequence data sets. We do uh, high throughput sequencing of millions of antibodies uh, alongside the immunization campaign. And um, ideally, what we want is to use that information to improve the way that we discover antibodies. Um, now, so far, this, this field is still somewhat in its infancy, and so far people have tried a lot of things that are mainly sequence-based to identify interesting antibodies. However, what we really like is to superimpose on top of this structural information. Um, and with a bodybuilder, this should be possible in theory, given that it's so fast and uh, we can tell which models should be accurate. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the kinds of things we can do here uh, that maybe we couldn't do without structural information is exemplified in the picture here, uh, where we have two pairs of sequences of antibody CDRH3 loops. Um, in one case, the sequences are extremely similar in the bottom case, 88% identity. However, um, if you look uh, on, the, on the picture B here, their shapes are actually quite different. Um, exemplified by the RMSD of 2.4 here. Um, in the other case, which is A, you have two sequences which are quite dis, uh, different. However, the loops have the same shape. Uh, and this is in the PDB, you can, you can look at this yourself. Um, so if we can model the structures uh, reliably, then we can start to, uh, to pick these cases apart where before we couldn't even tell that uh, that these existed. So we would have completely made the opposite, de opposite decisions of, of, uh, uh, of what I've just talked about. Um, so essentially we could start to identify convergence on common shapes rather than just looking at sequence. We could avoid these shape changing mutations that I've just mentioned. Um, and on top of this, we could start trying to predict additional properties of antibodies on top of this structural information for example, biophysical or developability characteristics, as well as actual uh, structural complementarity with the uh, epitope of interest on an antigen. So there's a lot of potential in this, um, but the main question now that I'm trying to answer is, well, if we can only men, uh, model 10% of our sequences, then maybe this kind of approach isn't that useful yet. But if we can model a large percentage of sequences, then we can actually start to work with this. So how big is this proportion of, uh, of modulable sequences versus the unmodelable sequences? Um, next slide, please. Okay, so millions of antibody sequences. We have about 3,000 known antibody structures. Uh, next slide, how big is, uh, or how does this huge gap affect our ability to model antibody structure? Next slide, please. So uh, this is the, the work with Konrad Kravchik. Um, it is currently under review. Um, we, ha we started from a, a data set uh, at UCB, which contained five million heavy chains uh, and eight million light chains. Um, these were IgM antibodies, um, so we like to call this the naive human data set um, from about 500 human donors. Um, and alongside this, uh, the Oxford guys also repeated this analysis on various immunized data sets, um, with, which contain about 36 million sequences in total. And we looked at our ability to model uh, all these antibody sequences either the whole sequence or just the framework region or each individual CDR by itself. Um, and the, on the right, I've mentioned some of the tools uh, used to do these. Um, the main ones to notice are uh, the structural antibody database uh, and the loop modeling tool called FREED. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the first, question to answer is how well can we model antibody frameworks? Intuitively, we should be quite good at this, but you know, how good are we? Um, so we take uh, every, so first we look at the, the protein data bank. Uh, we look at every antibody, non-redundant antibody structure in the protein data bank, and 
look at every possible pair within that data set. And we record sequence identity between any two antibodies, as well as the structural difference between these two antibodies um, over the framework region. And we do this independently for a heavy chain and light chain. Uh, and then we draw a graph. Um, next slide, please. Which looks a bit like this. So here are the blue lines um, show you this interdependency between sequence identity and structural difference. Um, sequence identity on the x-axis, structural difference on the y-axis here on the left. Um, so you can see at 80% sequence identity, you're generally at uh, somewhere between 0.8 and 0.9 uh, angstroms RMSD over the whole framework region, which is pretty good. Um, and then we also look at our NGS sequence data set. And for each sequence in that data set, we search the PDB for the closest template antibody uh, structure. So the, the most sequence identical uh, antibody in the protein data bank. And we uh, add those up and uh, draw this histogram in pink. Uh, so therefore, if you look at this line at 80% identity, any, everything to the right of this line makes up about 99% of the sequences of antibody frameworks in our NGS data set, which means if you go to the next slide, that uh, for 99% of the framework sequences, uh, we can create a model that's better than one angstrom RMSD. Um, and the same graph uh, that's for the heavy chains on the right side is the, for the light chains on the left side. It's uh, roughly the same trend. So we are very good at modeling frameworks. Um, and most frameworks, 99% of frameworks, we can model. Next slide. Now we're going to look at the CDR region. Um, so again, we go through our NGS data set. Uh, for each sequence in the data set, we consider each CDR sequence individually. Um, and we look at, uh, we, we try to find loops within the protein data bank that we have the structure for that have either identical sequence or that have uh, a close enough sequence so that we can model it using our freed uh, knowledge-based loop prediction algorithm. Um, and next slide, please. Uh, these are the numbers that we come up with. So uh, in summary, essentially, uh, most of the CDRs are very modelable. Uh, for all of the CDRs except for CDRH3, we can model at least 98% of the cases. Um, for CDRH3, which as we know is the hardest to model, we uh, can model about two thirds of the naive sequences and uh, nearly half of the immunized sequences in our various data sets. Um, I should say we're probably overestimating our ability to model, um, mainly because none of these analyses uh, consider the effects of heavy light chain pairing, because NGS data sets are typically unpaired, um, and are, are certainly are. So you have the heavy chain by itself and the light chain by itself. And we're also not looking at interactions between CDR loops. But with these caveats, um, these are the numbers. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, in summary, we can model about half of our uh, antibody FE sequences completely, um, which is mainly driven by our inability to model all uh, CDRH3s. Um, so if, you, uh, if, if you're interested in one particular antibody uh, towards a, a certain antigen and you're trying to model this one antibody, then, uh, well, you have a roughly 50% chance of uh, falling into the set that we can model completely and 50% that we we can't model it. In reality, that, that's not quite how it works, but um, uh, face value, you have a half-half chance. Um, and so there's a large gap uh, in our knowledge that we need to uh, close. Uh, next slide, please. 
So uh, in summary, going back to our applications, uh, the more structural knowledge we have, the better we can model, and therefore the better, uh, the, the higher the impact will be of structural knowledge on our therapeutic development, uh, and the better chances uh, that we make good therapeutics, essentially. Even in the first case, in the first example that I mentioned where no structural knowledge was used to, to discover the antibody itself, uh, today, if if I had to redo this project, I probably would use structural knowledge. I would use modeling and perhaps I would have discovered the antibody much more quickly or perhaps I would have discovered a, a different one. Um, simply because uh, of the advent of uh, next generation sequencing and large scale modeling. Same goes for essentially any knowledge based approach, whether it's the modeling itself or this uh, identification of uh, contact preference clouds or uh, a score to assess uh, a certain interaction between antibodies and antigens, all of these are, are generally knowledge-based and will benefit from having more structural information uh, in the protein data bank. Um, next slide, please. And yeah, this is the point where I hand over to Richard. So go ahead, Richard. Okay, thanks, uh, Seb. Um, you know, great introduction. Um, great, uh, you know, amount of information there in terms of antibodies and sort of how they are used in drug discovery, and also, of course, around sort of our current lack of understanding or knowledge uh, around sort of you know large parts of antibody structural space. So before I talk about the um, the Advance project, the Pistoia Alliance Advance, pro Advance project, I need to say a little bit about the Pistoia Alliance itself. So um, on this first slide, um, basically the, the Pistoia Alliance is a global not-for-profit alliance of life science companies, vendors, publishers, and academic groups, which operates in the pre-competitive space and counts many of the top global pharma companies as members. Uh, the aim of the Pistoia Alliance is to lower the barriers to innovation in life sciences R&D by facilitating what is now a pretty well-established decentralized innovation model. And this is distinct from the sort of the more centralized innovation model, which, you know, has probably been in operation, um, you know, and still is perhaps in some uh, areas, but you know certainly has been in operation sort of in in past years where big organizations were conducting every aspect of their innovation internally. So obviously uh, the decentralized model uh, is much more based on collaboration, open sharing of ideas and information, and lends itself um, you know to sort of greater overall success for everyone involved. Now, on this slide, I've also shown some examples of how business value is brought about in the pre-competitive space, and this sort of includes things like, like building new standards and tools and sharing or defining best practices. So next slide, please. So the Pistoia Alliance um, value proposition is focused on three key areas. <clears throat> Represented in grey, uh, value is achieved by retaining existing members and attracting new members. So the way the Pistoia Alliance is set up is to serve its member interests and no idea or activity is progressed without member buy-in and support. Represented in blue is the value which is achieved by running innovation challenges and competitions, things like startup challenges and hackathons. And then finally represented in red is the value achieved by uh, turning member ideas into projects which deliver, deliver added value to those members uh, or the community as a whole. And in the next slide, I will go into that in a little bit more detail. So uh, next slide, thank you. Um, so all ideas submitted um, by members um, you know, through the Pistoia Alliance tool. Um, so we do have a tool for this. Uh, go through a formal process which involves not only openly sharing these ideas, but then sort of follow up, uh, obtaining of buy-in, uh, funding, and creating a business case. Um, if this is then approved, projects are normally 
uh, officially launched uh, and then to obviously deliver the value proposition which is set out in that business case. Uh, the Pistoia Alliance has an active portfolio of projects and I'm just going to pick a couple of these as examples to highlight the sort of thing that we're doing. So for example the Chemical Safety Library project uh, has put together a database which is dedicated to sharing previously inaccessible hazardous reaction information uh, in the interest of increased lab and personal safety across chemical industries. Now previously this kind of information would have only been available within the companies where particular incidents had happened or occurred. Okay. Um, the second example is the HELM project. Now HELM stands for Hierarchical Editing Language for Macromolecules and the project has delivered a tool which enables the representation of a wide range of biomolecules, so proteins, nucleotides, antibody drug conjugates, etc., uh, whose size and complexity renders existing small molecule and sequence-based informatic methodologies impractical or unusable. So you can sort of think of this in, in, in a way as uh, you know, a, a smile string for all biomolecules. Now, as well as the active portfolio, the Pistoia Alliance also has an interesting developing portfolio. Um, and I'm just going to say a little bit more about the community of interest around AI and machine learning, since this is pretty hot topic at the moment. So a recent survey which was carried out by the Pistoia Alliance uh, found that 72% of life science professionals believe that their industry is behind other industries in terms of development of, AI, of you know, AI. Um, so to address this, Pistoia Alliance has established an AI center of excellence, uh, which holds regular webinars and discussions around the theme. And in addition to this, um, there's also two work streams ongoing. Uh, one which is looking at establishing best practices in AI, and a second one uh, which is uh, specifically developing use cases in areas of common interest where there are large amounts of data available. And uh, if you go to the website, and you know the link to the website was on one of my previous slides, uh, you can find out more about these projects and initiatives that are currently ongoing. Okay, next slide please. So moving on to the Pistoia Alliance Advanced project. Uh, we are a team of professionals from pharma, biotech and academia and consist of structural biologists, bioinformaticians, modelers, uh, all supported by the Pistoia Alliance. Uh, Seb is a part of that team um, and also Conrad and uh, Professor Charlotte Dean as well um, is, is part of this initiative. Um, the project is funded by, by pharma, by GSK, Roche and Lilly, and it's supported by the PDB. So next slide, please. Okay, um, so I mentioned ideas and sort of moving those ideas through the, the Pistoia Alliance sort of uh, innovation process. Um, so the idea actually came about uh, for this project some years ago at an EMBL EBI workshop um, to meet the challenge basically described by Seb earlier. Um, how can we plug the gaps in our knowledge of antibody structural space beyond just you know waiting for organic growth of the PDB, for example? Um, and the thinking was that a quick win could be to release uh, existing proprietary structures owned by pharma companies that had no associated IP with them um, into the PDB. Okay, now these structures may not provide the sort of biggest bang for buck in terms of a novelty perspective, but information on any structure, and especially those derived, you know, in the context of drug discovery efforts, will probably give some added value. That is one approach. Um, what would add the most value, and this is sort of the second approach, is if we could pick the right structures, i.e., which structures, if solved, will deliver the most knowledge or, or most new knowledge in the least populated areas of antibody structural space. So as Seb has highlighted, um, there are, you know, the biggest challenge um, arguably is predicting the structure of CDRH3. So we decided to focus on CDRH3. Um, and we set about triaging the NGS data set, which Seb has described, uh, using uh, selected criteria. 
uh, down to a number which was manageable in terms of sequences which we could then put into crystallization experiments. And this is what is represented uh, on the panel. Uh, so on the y-axis you've got the number of sequences and on the x-axis you've got um, the CDRH3 loop length. Okay, so we went down from approximately 5 million heavy chain sequences to about 50,000 non-redundant CDRH3 sequences um, and there's still a set of criteria that we could apply to pick um, to get this number down to sort of in the hundreds um, to then sort of put into crystallization experiments. Okay, in addition to this uh, we also did deliver to some extent on our quick win approach uh, and we released eight new proprietary structures into the PDB last year. Um, and if you know how sort of pharma operates, um, this is no sort of, um, you know, this is a challenge. I mean, eight doesn't sound like a, like a big number, uh, but to get uh, pharma companies to release some of their proprietary information um, can be quite challenging, as I said. So, um, you know, a, a small victory in itself and a, a certainly a step in the right direction. Um, now, having highlighted the importance of obtaining new templates, um, you know, we understand that adding novel structure information uh, into the into the public domain, into the PDB, is, is probably only half the picture. Um, and, you know, granted that if we want to achieve the goals stated on this slide, it may be sufficient to provide more templates. Uh, however, if we do ultimately want to have the greatest impact on drug discovery, we also need to tackle the computational aspect, i.e. understand um, as a starting point what the current state of modeling software is and where the limitations lie. So next slide please. Okay. Okay, so basically there's you know two to three depending on how you look at it approaches to modeling antibody structures and these are knowledge-based approaches ab initio approaches or a combination of the two the so-called hybrid approach uh, knowledge-based uh, antibody modeling is the most common approach and it follows a fairly well established process which is based on availability of the appropriate template and this is what's shown in the panel on the right uh, now, the main issues with obtaining good models um, are the correct uh, orientation of the um, heavy variable and uh, light variable domains, um, and also, as mentioned previously by Seb and myself, you know, the modeling of the CDRH3 loop accurately. Now, uh, knowledge base approaches, uh, as Seb said, are, are fast, accurate. Um, if templates are available, um, whereas ab initio approaches are computationally expensive and accuracy drops with loop length. However, ab initio methods can do a pretty good job if no template is available. The problem is, or the challenge is, should we say, uh, picking the good models from the bad ones from the output that's obtained. So, Hybrid approaches, which combine both methodologies, uh, have also been developed. And if you're basically looking to uh, do loop prediction, um, ab initio and hybrid approaches are what you would go for. Um, and probably the recommendation would be to use a hybrid approach, uh, software like Sphinx, which is uh, mentioned here, um, you know, so as to not to ignore the available structure information to do your loop prediction. Next slide, please. So just to reinforce uh, some of what uh, Seb just said. Um, so the top three panels on the slide here uh, show selected results from the Antibody Modeling Assessment 2 competition, which was published in 2014, in which blinded structures were modeled using a number of different software packages. And each panel, uh, in each panel, what the rows show is the results for the 11 structures which were used in the competition. Uh, so these are the models. And, on the co and the columns show the corresponding result for the various structural elements. So these are the whole um, FV region, 
the framework alone, and then the various CDR loops. So the results are color-coded in terms of backbone RMSD between the solved crystal structure and the model produced for the competition. Uh, and there's probably no surprise um, in that the competition highlights that the existing challenge is with modeling CDRH3 in particular. So if you look at the uh, column on the far right for each of those panels, you can see you know, a lot of red and orange, which is obviously not good. Um, and less so of the of the green. Whereas if you look at um, you know the 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 second column from the left, which is the framework region, um, as Seb highlighted, it's mostly green. Okay. Um, now, if we look at the the bottom the bottom right panel, uh, so these are results produced by a bodybuilder. Uh, which has been mentioned by Seb in 2016. Um, and what this suggests is that software capabilities have moved in the right direction over, you know, uh, sort of the few years from when the uh, AMA uh, 2 competition was held. Um, since in theory, uh, the same database was used to provide templates for both sets of analyses. However, uh, it's always difficult to establish whether, you know, you're doing a like like for like comparison um, you know when you're doing this sort of retrospective assessment uh, however as Seb sort of mentioned the biggest advantages of using something like a body builder is not only the speed and reliability um, and by reliability we mean um, you know representation of knowing in this case you know which row you are in in terms of you know this this panel because most software won't actually tell you that so as an example is if each of these rows was an output from your modeling exercise um, you wouldn't actually know with other software which row you were in i.e which model to pick and to take forward whereas a bodybuilder gives you an indication of that um, there's two important points that I want to emphasize in terms of uh, modeling software. Um, so all these methods, the first is that all these methods are based on modeling uh, and measuring accuracy of the C-alpha RMSD. So side chains are to some extent an, an afterthought. Uh, they're not included in the computation. There is software available that takes care of, um, you know, takes care of side chains, uh, but I'm not going to go with sort of into those specifically. Um, and then the second point uh, is that all these methods are focused on modeling uncomplexed antibodies. Yeah, and when you're thinking of drug discovery, arguably the most value is in understanding the structure of your antibody antigen complex, as Seb has highlighted already. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, as part of the uh, Advance project, uh, the Pistoia Alliance Advance project, uh, at the end of last year, we established uh, additional collaborations with, with BioXL, with Medimmune, and the Spanish National Research Council. And we put together a funding proposal to the European Union under the Horizon 2020 program with a view to take um, Advance project work forward. Now, um, sad to say that despite receiving a very competitive score of 79%, we were informed last month that we were not awarded the funding this time around. However, uh, we do believe, uh, I certainly believe, that we have a very innovative and competitive proposal, and as such, uh, we are likely to take it forward again this year. So what are we actually looking to do? Next slide, please. Um, so our integrated modeling of antibodies proposal, or IMABS for short, uh, includes the generation of novel structure equity and also an approach to improve our computational capabilities for modeling antigen, uh, antibody antigen complexes based on integrating Gromax and Haddock. Okay. Um, now, as I said before, understanding and improving uh, you know, antibody-antigen interactions is in many ways at the heart of every successful antibody drug discovery project. And this can't be done uh, with information on the antibody alone. Although you could argue that knowledge of the structure, whether it's a crystal structure or a model, together with experimental data would certainly help. 
Um, existing software has been used to date in a piecemeal fashion to provide complex structure information, uh, but we believe that having a single process which produces a refined complex model based on structure and experimental information from real drug discovery projects could add distinct value. Okay, so to summarize, next slide please. So Seb and I have basically told you that, um, you know, having available and accurate structure information throughout the life cycle of a drug discovery uh, process or project is important um, to increase the confidence in making decisions. Um, we currently have tools which can predict most region of the antibody, most regions of the antibody, uh, with a pretty good degree of accuracy. Uh, we're pretty good at the framework. Um, and you know this gives you obviously high confidence in the results. Um, and uh, we can do this fairly quickly, and we can apply this to millions of sequences at a time. However, there are important regions uh, for which we still have considerable gaps uh, in our capabilities and our understanding, namely around CDRH3. Um, and the Pistoia Alliance Advance project aims to address these challenges by taking both a structure and computational approach. And through the IMAPS proposal, which I've just described, have a direct impact on real drug discovery use cases by focusing on structures of complexes. So next slide, please. Okay, so if you found what you've heard today interesting, uh, or if you have any comments or ideas, please get in touch with me. Um, there are opportunities for those who can to get involved and participate in the project, primarily around contributing structures and or resources, and or also to join this year's funding proposal, IMAB's funding proposal, that is. So at this stage, I uh, thank you for your attention and I'm going to hand back over to Ian. Hi, um, thank you very much uh, from Seb and Richard for such a, an interesting uh, pair of talks. Um, so I'd like to encourage everybody who's uh, still with us to um, uh, ask any questions. Um, so far, I haven't seen any appear in the panel yet. Um, so um, yeah, let's see if I can. Yeah, okay. I yeah, if you could enter your questions, um, that would be good. Um, I think Rossen may have a question, and he is able to talk to us. Rossen. Yes. Thanks, uh, Richard and Sebastian. It was uh, really interesting to to hear about antibodies and. Uh, I, I was interested the the software that is currently used for modeling a bodybuilder and the other tools. How how efficient is it? How um, how productive can you be with it on on these HPC resources that are currently available? Is it pretty streamlined the whole procedure? What's the throughput that you can get? What are the opportunities for improvement there? Seb, I think Seb's closest to uh, a builder. Are you able to talk to us, Seb? Uh, Seb was okay. Muted. Hello. <laughs> now ah, you can hi, hear me. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Yes. So uh, a body builder. Yeah. Uh, so it is very quick, uh, as I mentioned. It's about thirty seconds on average per model. Um, it is written in Python, and uh, I mean, it's mainly written in a way where to parallelize it, you would need to run, uh, you know, multiple copies of the tool, um, one copy per core or so. Um, so it's uh, basically, it has been run uh, in Oxford and I think on Amazon AWS uh, in large scale 
uh, I think mainly via uh, some shell scripts, um, uh, hundreds of CPUs at a time at least. Um, and I, I don't know exactly the numbers in terms of how well it scales, but it should scale fairly well. Um, the main bottleneck is possibly um, the uh, the I/O essentially, so the reading from the disk quickly, since uh, at least the loop modeling part will perform a database search, um, and um, you can also parallelize a single run if you want to, uh, mainly by modeling. Um, I think searching for for multiple CDR templates at the time, but uh, I think mainly it's meant to be run multiple uh, multiple copies of, of the A body builder process um, on multiple cores. I don't know if that answers your question exactly, but essentially, uh, I, I'm sure you could uh, perform additional integration with uh, queuing systems, etc., to, to streamline the use on on HPC clusters. Great, thanks, Seb. Yeah. Um, I've got questions coming in now. Um, three questions have appeared in the question panel. Um, in the interest of speed, uh, I'll, I'll identify the asker and read out the questions and proceed from there. So this is from uh, Mor Mauricio uh, Menegatirigio. Here we go. Uh, apologies for the pronunciation. Uh, the question is: How do do how do you compute? How does compute? charges in silico to evaluate protein antibody interactions if we think in terms of electrostatic potential this is very important to assess the interaction so are you able to compute charges i think is is basically um, after that question yes so uh the i think this alludes a bit to this uh approach i mentioned with the contact clouds um, so that particular approach doesn't do any physics-based calculations. It is a purely knowledge-driven approach. Um, so it's basically completely based on statistics. Um, so if you see certain charged uh, amino acid uh, atoms uh, of amino acids interact with certain other charged atoms in another amino acid, then that would be represented in those contact clouds that you see. Um, you can use a completely different approach, of course. You can use various energy functions that will try to compute uh, charges in a more physics-driven manner uh, and use that to score. Um, and certainly people do that. Um, we do it as well, mainly in the context of molecular dynamics uh, simulations, etc., cetera, and, and free energy calculations. Um, but uh, that is a completely separate method from what I've talked about. Okay, thanks for that. Um, I've got, got a, another question from Sid uh, Shridharan. Uh, how, how, do you, how did you select the 50K sequences for modeling? What is the sequence identity of these to known structures? Oh, his okay. question. Yeah, hi Sid. Yeah. Um, yes, so uh, that was the numbers that Richard showed, reducing the 5 million sequences down to 50,000. Um, that included quite a number of filters. Um, the actual, essentially sequence redundancy, I think is what you're asking. Um, so uh, between these sequences and that 50,000 set, um, you would have at least five uh, mutations between any two sequences. So if you reduce that number to say three, you would have a much larger sequence data set. Um, so this is a very crude way of reducing numbers. Um, we also did additional filtering, including this whole modelability idea that um, I, I mentioned as well, um, and a few other things, including you know li uh, developability problems that are easy to predict, et cetera. Um, but you would probably want to prioritize this data set even more um, and you could do it certainly with a uh, with a view towards uh, essentially looking at numbers of sequences that are similar to this particular H3 sequence in the known um, antibody sequence space, um, which we could okay. you know talk about more. Uh, but but we, we're running out of time unfortunately. We're running out of time. Anyway, <laughs> thank you for those questions. Uh, we we are indeed running out of time, and I have just one final. 
uh, slide, um, which is about the next webinar. Um, uh, that is um, entitled Biosim Space, Fill in the Gaps Between Molecular Simulation Codes. And this will be given by Christopher Woods of University of Bristol at the end of this month on the 27th. So everybody uh, would, who has uh, called in today would be welcome to attend our next webinar. Thank you very much, everybody, for uh, attending today. Thank you, especially to our presenters. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.